um, without further ado, uh, Marco, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. So let me get my presentation. So you all see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. There's a little share bottom at yes. the very bottom of the page. Of the, here we go. Yeah. Yep, we see it. Okay. So, yeah, I'm not really familiar with your community, so I hope it will be uh, useful. I will uh, first talk about what is HM based modeling, and maybe good to know my formal training is in operations research um, and applied math and mathematics. So, um, and then I will talk a little bit about the history related to applications to human environmental systems. I will present a um, example of water governance in uh, Mexico City and I will finalize uh, final slides will be a little bit about uh, some uh, current uh, activities that we are doing in uh, actually another kind of network that is similar to yours at least a few years ago we had a, a, a network from nsf that we continue um so what uh, do we mean with agent-based modeling it's basically computer simulation where we are interested in understanding the micro level patterns uh, which are caused by uh, micro level behavior we often you may have that too with your geological um, examples, but we often look more at, uh, at social or ecological examples. So here are some kind of questions that, that people are interested in, um, how the traffic uh, jams emerge, what are what leads to hits and flops of movies, financial markets. Um, so a lot of these kind of questions, so, uh, um, and a lot, a lot of similar questions in, in ecology. So agent-based modeling is now a term that is used, uh, especially within the uh, ecology and in the social sciences, but you also find people who do research in medical areas, uh, say models of cancer will use the term agent-based models. Uh, often these are about agents who have um, um, decision rules. Uh, we can represent them as decision rules and they are interacting with other agents in a, uh, non-random way so there might be a structure uh, of interactions because of social networks or because of the environment so this is a kind of cartoonist way of <clears throat> the an agent based model so we have the agents have their uh, decision rules the if then else statements uh, they are in they, you can have uh, agents and different levels of organizations you can have a firm that exists of agents and firms are also competing with each other so you can have different levels uh, and there are also um, um, kind of actors who are not um, in a way making decisions as part of the environment so we are uh, a lot of this work is in the context uh, of complex adaptive systems so that's uh, um, a lot of this work is in that context where um, we look at systems of of individual units which are interacting, leading to uh, different skills and leading to all kind of macro level phenomena. So, agent-based models is one of the tools that they use to study complex adaptive systems. So. Uh, I teach uh, a lot of applied math students, so a question I often get, and it might also be useful here, is, is it actually mathematics? And uh, they have to remind people about some uh, history of mathematics. Um, so, um, so a lot of people might be familiar with uh, the, our focus on the calculus as the mathematical method, although Isaac Newton wrote his work using geometry, but now we are uh, uh, some people are talking about we are now and in, get in moving to the algorithmic kind of uh, phase that we describe a lot of systems using math uh, algorithms. So, 
and yes, Alan Turing was a mathematician. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so that it's a different type of math, but a lot of uh, systems we can describe it uh, in, in formal uh, algorithmic uh, statements. Um, there are some, um, and I will now describe some uh, some of the challenges, especially related to the social science. A lot of these uh, algorithmic expressions are our understanding of how these systems work, especially in the social sciences. We don't have um, kind of natural laws about how how the the world works. So we have a lot of qualitative understanding. We may have alternative qualitative understandings. Um, and go to your psychology department and you will find uh, at least one theory uh, for every uh, faculty member. So there is no universal theory about how people make decisions. And so there are a lot of, but and a lot of these uh, theories are not very uh, precise. So there's a lot of kind of vagueness of, of this qualitative understanding about how people make decisions or how groups of uh, people are are interacting. Uh, so that's one of the ways which we why uh, uh, we use agent based models too is to test this uh, consequence of alternative um, uh, st uh, algorithmic statements. Uh, we use uh, data as inputs, and there is a, a lot to be said about this. You mentioned uh, about um, uh, basically a large amount of data. Um, really depends on your application area. If you work in finance, uh, financial applications, a lot of data which you can work with, and there are people creating agent-based models where the models are automatically calibrated on, uh, on data that is, uh, comes in uh, real time. Um, I work uh, with archaeologists and uh, there is not much hard data. And so you have very different types of data. And so that's the, uh, so there's no kind of universal principle here. Um, there's a, depends on your application area, you will have uh, different ways of how to um, uh, to cope with with data, but um, so the in a contrast to uh, to say methods like uh, uh, geographical information systems or statistical models, uh, agent based models are focused on the the, the logic, the the algorithm st uh, algorithmic statements, and the data are used to evaluate that, inform the assumptions, it's not data-driven. Uh, uh, most of the models are not data-driven. Um, so uh, this is especially within the social sciences, um, we find typically um, correlations, um, but the agent-based models uh, make assumptions about causal mechanisms. And these algorithmic statements are, assume a causal mechanism, but often we actually don't know. Um, I, part of my research is doing controlled experiments, but we actually have no idea how people make the decisions, even if we do very uh, detailed um, um, experiments with human subjects, we don't know why people make the decisions they do. We only observe the behavior. So it's very difficult in that way to um, we have to make assumptions about the causal mechanism that the, way the data we have are, well, they are correlations. And a lot of the theories are very vague in terms of the, the correlations they have. So there has been a very provocative article a number of years ago um, the, about the end of theory, and um, which might be, because um, uh, we have all this this big data of, uh, say data from social media coming and we can do a lot of social science uh, with that data. So why do we uh, uh, bother with, uh, with theory? And um, so the, I typically uh, pose this issue because a lot of people, when they see the kind of things and why don't you use machine learning? Well, often we 
uh, still want to use something like agent-based models instead of machine learning because we are interested in, well, in theory and the implication of theory and not to uh, extrapolate the sales of uh, the, a lot of data that we collected today about the sales patterns uh, from today. So if we want to explore what are the responses of people in the future to say climatic change, we cannot use uh, some machine learning algorithm. Uh, so it's still depend on theory and uh, not on extrapolation of some past data. Uh, but that's, uh, there's an increased amount of people in computational social science where uh, solely focusing on uh, big data and machine learning. And that's a quite different, um, topic than the kind of work we are doing with agent-based models. So um, I put a little bit of hist historical perspective of agent-based model and sustainability uh, also to show that it's not a new method. A lot of these uh, tools have been used for decades, although we didn't use the term agent-based modeling. I guess uh, a lot of you may know the World Tree model, limits to growth, uh, although that's a systemics model. Um, it uh, is interesting to see that there was uh, an agent-based version of that. Uh, they didn't uh, use the term agent-based, but um, when I did my dissertation in the 90s and I thought I had something new, some people referred to this paper from the 70s that was also using some agency in having agents so it has a kind of adaptive response to changes in the environment so basically the 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 population who is polluting and and growing over time were responding to what they observed so that was a kind of intelligent model uh, which was uh, responding so there was a kind of a learning process. Um, there a lot of the one of the kind of founding fathers of this kind of work is Thomas Schelling, although he didn't use himself computer simulations. Um, one of his key models, uh, the uh, Schelling segregation model, is he did it himself by with uh, coins, um, uh, pennies and dimes. Um, he wrote an influential book in the 70s, Micro Motors and Micro Behavior. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for some other work, but uh, within the agent-based community, he's one of the kind of the founding fathers of this way of thinking, thinking about what are these mechanisms leading to this micro-level outcomes. And um, uh, I'm not going into the details of the segregation model, but if you will look at some agent-based work, you will come quickly to some of his work on segregation. Uh, Rob Axelrod, a political scientist, uh, did some uh, important work using uh, computer simulations in the early 80s. And um, he looked at a question about um, uh, cooperation and, and um, uh, basically he did a tournament where people could submit uh, algorithms about how people will play in a repeated prison slammer game and he showed that uh, that you could that actually a good strategy for for the long term in a repeated prison slammer game was tit for tat and he used all kind of simulations in the years later uh, to understand uh, more about uh, uh, conditions for cooperation. He also made models about culture, uh, cultural change, uh, uh, models of norms. And um, so he was a political scientist. He had some training. He, I think his bachelor was in mathematics. You had a, a strong math background, but he used it with very kind of simple models. Um, by that time in computer science, we got into multi-agent systems. You still see that term uh, used. Uh, nowadays, we, in the social science, when we, we talk about agent-based models, but if we, people talk about multi-agent systems, that is for us a kind of an, uh, refer to the computer science uh, community who are creating agents that help us doing certain tasks, not about how 
uh, that we try to represent how humans make decisions. But you have a lot of multi-agent systems in your phone or in, on your computer, all kind of algorithms who are doing tasks for you. But a lot of the underlying software, in a way, was influential for the kind of tools that were developed that we are now using. But multi-agent systems refer now to the kind of computer science uh, perspective. So they are not interested how people make decisions, but creating tools uh, for us. In ecology, we start in the ages getting individual-based modeling, uh, a lot of models from forest or fish. Um, and uh, so that's, that's um, a very developed uh, area. They now also start using the term agent-based models because it be became a more broader used terminology. Um, I refer now to the group in France, but that was for me one of the first groups I saw using agent-based models for human environmental systems. You know, people were trained in multi-agent systems to start applying this to uh, sustainability-related issues. Um, and they developed uh, a, tool, a tool, CoreMOS, which is uh, based on Smalltalk. Uh, they did a lot of uh, applications in uh, developing countries and uh, develop using models together with uh, with the stakeholders. Uh, Sugarscape, it's uh, a publication that uh, became very, uh, uh, kind of set the tone for what is all possible. It uh, is a, a highly cited uh, book with a lot of, a kind of an artificial world where they, uh, show all kind of possible things you can explore if you create this artificial world with, with agents. And um, so um, also one of the key things. Santa Fe Institute, I think people may have know that that has been an influential force. The Journal of Artificial Science and Social Simulations, you will start seeing in the 90s, a lot of things start happening, uh, which are still define a lot of the environment today. Uh, ABM applied to land use change is a, is a big area of application, uh, probably one of the biggest also in terms of empirical applications. There's a lot of uh, data that is uh, available like uh, remote sensing, GIS systems that makes developing those models more intuitive compared to a lot of other types of models. And there is an increased amount of platforms. Um, also, a lot of them started in the late 90s. Um, so NetLogo is the most uh, widely used platform. Um, I use that also myself. <clears throat> but uh, basically, there are uh, maybe 100 different platforms that, that people are using. So I will now show a uh, um, a briefly a project that uh, might be related to some of your interests is related to water management in Mexico City. Um, it, we had people also from um, uh, the natural sciences involved and I will briefly show some of the aspects of the project and the, the agent based modeling part. So uh, while well, Mexico City uh, is, a, is a big city, a lot of inequality, and it was originally created on a lake. So uh, it should be no surprise that there are a lot of flooding problems in uh, Mexico City, um, but uh, there are also problems in terms of uh, uh, availability of uh, potable water. So uh, there are still some parts of Mexico City are in your uh, traditional uh, water system, but that's very rare. Now it's basically this uh, the the city landscape that you saw earlier. So, uh, so there's a lot of problems of water scarcity in the higher areas of the city where they have not the infrastructure to pipe water, and in the center of the city there is the water problem of floodings and. Um, there's another problem with the subsidence. Um, and uh, so large areas are uh, sinking because of extraction of groundwater, which is now restricted, but uh, it's still happening at a certain scale. Um, and the goal of the project, and I will give some uh, references to more for more information, is we 
this is a problem that is very difficult to really get ahead around and it's not that we create a model that provides a solution but we try to create an integrated model of both the social and the kind of natural science part in which we bring together different types of information and be able to explore different futures and the agency in the model representing neighborhoods and the water authorities they have different mental models of the systems in making their decisions and we can explore how vulnerability is of the system is changed by their mental model so where put uh, do the different decision makers put their attention so there are about 2000 neighborhoods and there's this one water authority which is the uh, focusing on on the inf creating the infrastructure the water authority makes decisions about where to invest in infrastructure new infrastructure and maintenance um, and they have to make decisions where where in the city to invest resources and neighborhoods can adapt they can protest and, um, and so there are different uh, rules uh, uh, about that so how do we did we collect that information because it's not that we we have a standard model about neighborhoods neighborhoods if you will be a social scientist you will be upset that we think that neighborhoods make decisions because it's not that neighborhoods make decisions there are people making decisions but we simplify the problem by assuming we can have an, uh, uh, represent um, neighborhoods as an agent. And so we had all kinds of focus group discussions with uh, uh, a number of neighborhoods to collect data about what are priorities of them, what are differences between neighborhoods. And so, and then we use data, uh, uh, census data to kind of uh, identify types of neighborhoods so that we could kind of uh, quantify the different types of neighborhoods about how their priorities lay and and we coupled the model of the agents agents decisions with some simplified models of climate and uh, hydrological models originally we were the plan was to connect it with the with full-scale models of climate and hydrology etc uh, but in the end, the agent-based model became more important also that we would like to use this more interactively and do sensitivity analysis. Um, and so in the end, we have an agent-based model that is now being used with stakeholders and they have kind of statistical versions of uh, the um, uh, more natural science models. So, uh, because the model is used real time with stakeholders, uh, not all these um, kind of natural science dynamics could be included because these models are often more time consuming. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what the mental models. Um, not want to go into much detail here. Um, we really simplify a lot of the social science. Um, we exclude uh, corruption, a lot of the political dynamics. We know these are all important, but a lot of these things are not really observable and we try to keep the model as simple as possible and have a few of these kind of algorithmic statements that we could also uh, kind of validate by we created a game and went back to the neighborhoods and played a game with people from neighborhoods and the game represented the model and we could get feedback about how the game were representing decisions they were making so we could get a kind of independent feedback about how we represent the neighborhoods in the in the model so that's so in terms of um Validating these type of models, it's it's a lot of also here qualitative, expert uh, oriented because it's not that we have a, a big data set about, okay, this is how people make decisions and we can have very detailed information to, to test uh, models of that. So it is, in this case, we went to experts and get their feedback uh, on on how we represent uh, that decision making in, our, in the model 
So this is a kind of cartoon version, how we represent the mono. We have the kind of the flooding in the center of the uh, city. And then the poor neighborhoods are on the hills and they don't have the infrastructure to get potable water. Um, so this is an example of how we represent the output. Um, and um, now, it, well, Mexico City is a highly uh, th this is what prone flooding and what scarce is a problem they have to deal with every every day and um, we work with UNAM uh, and so they have a decision theater where they will they are using the model with the stakeholders we have to see whether how this will have an impact it will be difficult to evaluate uh, the, the the colleagues in UNAM they have a lot of expertise in working with those kind of stakeholders um, but it's kind of unpredictable to to know whether this model it's not a model about prediction it we would like to uh to see that uh, that if they see the consequences of their of the priorities they have on the vulnerabilities in the different parts of the city that this may change their priorities so in a way we like the model to be wrong and that their uh, mental models may change over time because of the interaction uh, with the model. But if, if there will be a change in mental model, we don't know whether it is just because of how we interact with them or there are other, other reasons why they may change their mental model. Okay, so here are some, uh, there are, there is a, this is a big CNH grant uh, behind it, and these are some papers uh, about the model that uh, came out uh, this year. Uh, so um, if people want to follow up on that. And we also make the, the software all um, publicly available. And one of the things that we did last few months is to create an R version of the code that is more uh, accessible and uh, be able to apply this to um, with the idea that it could be applied for for other cities um, so i want to finish with some this kind of um, uh, current issues that uh, we are also interacting with some groups who are in a more in a natural science so often when we do these integrated models um, like in the make adapt uh, project we we want to create all the different components ourselves. Um, well, we don't have really the capacity for that. And it would be nice if you could, uh, uh, in a way, connect existing models that we can trust what others have been doing on, high, uh, say, hydrological model or the climate model and connect these different models together uh, and focus on the, on, the, on the component of the models that we have uh, more uh, expertise with. So this is a big challenging area um, because then you have to standardize some of the inputs and outputs and you may have to couple models that run in different kind of languages. Um, so this is a collaboration. Uh, the Open Modeling Foundation is a collaboration between different kind of modeling communities uh, from the, um, I was it, the the Earth surface systems uh, the, in Colorado, uh, ecological modeling, uh, our group, which is more about the social science modeling, but there are about 10 different communities who are trying now to um, can develop some collaboration because we need to then define some standards and um, about how, how, if we want to do something like this, how this will, have to have some standards of uh, for models and how models are interacting with each other. There are a few pilot studies being done, uh, and it is quite uh, a challenge to come to some uh, uh, kind of common standards between different types of, of models. But that's uh, a direction that might be useful instead of uh, kind of reinventing the wheel which we often do when we develop these more integrated models. 
So what next? If you want to know more about agent-based models, there are some good textbooks. Um, Railsback and Grimm are ecologists. They wrote a textbook um, uh, which is uh, really good on terms of the uh, how to use it for research. I use that uh, typically in my, my graduate class. Another good textbook is by Yuri Walensky and, and Bill Red, where who have been developing the NetLogo. Um, uh, language books, books use NetLogo as their um, kind of uh, uh, platform. Um, I'm working myself on a, um, a, a textbook which I make it uh, available as a, an EPUB um, and it will be available later this year. And I focus on social and sociological systems. A drawback of the previous two is that there was not much focus on social science and uh, my students want to know more about that so I, that's why i started writing my own but uh, there is a nice MOOC by bill rand uh, comes uh, via the santa fe complexity explorer and there is a recent uh, kind of online book for on hms modeling for those who want to learn it by themselves basically a kind of tutorial of a of a basic a model um, and finally, I want to um, be, uh, refer to COMSYS, that's, the, that's uh, our uh, kind of uh, uh, cyber infrastructure project. We have a lot of information about um, you know, computational models, especially agent-based models in the life of social sciences. And we also have a computational library, uh, which exists now, we have more than 650, uh, models. So a lot of this work, um, and we we have done a study of more than seven thousand publications, where we find that about ten percent of the publications share their code, and it's increasing, but it's it's now getting up to uh, almost twenty percent, but it's not sufficient. So we're trying to push for journals to improve their uh, standards um, and that people will share their um, their their code and have good documentation so that we are um, can do real science and build on each other's work instead of um, uh, all kind of reinvent the wheel ourselves um, and while this is a bigger issue in computational science in in, in, in general but um, we are within the agent-based model community, we are trying to um, uh, push that agenda. Uh, and so uh, if you want to know more, you will find uh, information about that here. So I look forward to your questions. Uh, it was very brief and uh, a lot of information probably in a short time, but I hope it was useful for you. Thank you, Marco. That was terrific. This is Suzanne, and I just want to open it up to see if anyone has any questions. You had a lot of great information and many resources in your presentation that I really appreciate that you included. Does anyone? Um, I'll, I'll count to seven slowly so you can unmute. I had a quick question, Marco. Can you hear me? Yes, I could hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Pat, and I, I, I'm hopeful that you'll be able to share the presentation. I, I realized I was taking a screenshot of every single slide. And so <laughs> I think that's probably not a very efficient way to go about that. Um, but I did have a question. So I know that you said that um, sort of machine learning is sort of associated with a different way of kind of gleaning information from a system. And that a lot of the ABM work is really guided by an understanding of the theory and the mechanisms, particularly what's going on in, inside the agent's minds. And I was curious whether or not, even though you said that, have you ever gone back to sort of reverse engineer, maybe using some machine learning or data science methods to try and say, okay, well now we have a sense of how these agents are making decisions. We have a sense of the outcome. Can you use some of these other methods um, that don't tackle mechanistic understanding or reflect theory, but just reflect the full set of options, so to speak. Can you use those methods to reverse engineer the decision outcomes 
to then come up with some new understanding of the possible kind of constellation of mental models? That's a good question. Uh, for the kind of applications I work, typically work with, we don't have uh, big data, but I'm uh, writing now a, uh, uh, a grant where we want to include machine learning because we want to get large number of data. This relates to communication. Um, so, so yeah, th then a, that could be then a, an approach. Um, so, but that's a, that's a good question, and I think that I I may have been critical here as for those who are more into the machine learning because it's a typical question we we get um, and um, so it might also be good to realize that um, humans are part of the system and so when we make uh, when we make models uh, so when we use data to to infer uh, decisions the mo moment that people realize they're part of the system that the, the kind of decision making might already have been changed so that's the uh, that's some of these uh, some of the challenges so uh, that's why when I when I teach it I try to explain that we should not focus on extrapolation but have a good grasp of the theory uh, not that the theories that we have are really satisfying we don't really understand much about how people make decisions, but it, it's a good, um, would be a good idea to, uh, uh, if you have an example, and I can imagine that there are colleagues who are more in marketing or financial applications who have a lot of data, they could do something like that. And there might, and I have to look, but there might be already studies on that because there are now some, people will start developing models which are automatically kind of uh, calibrate or that the agents are created by machines instead of by humans in a way. So that there might be in some subject areas, there might be something done already. Um, Just to quickly build off of that, the, uh, since, you, since you're looking at water use in Mexico City, just to zoom out a little bit in terms of water use, um, here in Fort Collins in Colorado, uh, every house was installed, I think every house was installed with a smart meter from the city utility. So there's astonishingly detailed data almost in real time uh, in terms of uh, at least electricity use. Um, and I know that similar data might exist for water utilities. Now, maybe not in Mexico City, I'm not sure, but just thinking about what types of partners could you work with that would have access to highly temporally resolved data that's spatially extensive uh, to everybody that has a connection um, that might be able to somehow provide information or contain information that might reflect some of those kind of user decisions that would be uh, responding to other signals, uh, but but so, uh, do you know whether uh, because I uh, we we um, at least what we know here from the Phoenix area is that yeah we have these all these smart um, uh, meters too, but the water and energy companies will not provide us access to that kind of data. Uh, so and uh, so that's that's another other challenge so these companies they have a lot of data they will not willing to share that um, uh, for various reasons so um, but yes there is a lot of of this detailed data available uh, and that will make this much more possible uh, to create more these higher resolution models so so far there has been a major challenge of getting access to data. I remember uh, about 20 years ago when I worked with a psychology students on consumer behavior, we got um, interest from a company, um, um, Unilever, uh, who wanted to work with us. And we said, wow, that will be great. Uh, can you give access to your data? No way, 
<laughs> so they created their own uh, research uh, program in London, and they don't didn't provide us, and they just want to have our knowledge. They didn't want to share their data. So it's um, um, yeah, there's a lot of data is collected, but it's not necessarily being uh, shared for academics. Some people are getting access to data um like irs data there's this uh, one colleague who works on uh, uh, dynamics of firms he gets irs data but that data cannot leave the the kind of the building so he um will have to yeah he gets some security clearance get access to certain types of data and then but that data cannot be shared beyond his um, his research team so so yeah, there's a lot, you have to deal with privacy issues. And, and, and so that's one of our issues related to um, the competitiveness of those companies. So. Does anyone else have a, I have a question, but I wanna hold my questions to make sure everybody gets a chance to ask. So Marco, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Comsys. Um, it looks like that might be the network that you were talking about that started as an RCN and now I love seeing that you have a cyber infrastructure where you're sharing resources at our June workshop we started sharing via um, an agave data uh, portal with this group but we'd really like to make it more robust and I'm just curious can you tell us a bit of the story about Comses? is that how you say it Coms Co yes, yeah so uh, we got a RCN a long time ago, um, and I think that we created a, um, well, we got various grants over the years, let's put it in that way, and one was an RCN. The current grant we have is part of the big data network of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, NSF, so we are a, 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 a spoke. Um, mm -hmm. And um, well, sustainability of this kind of work is uh, is a, is a, of cyber infrastructure is a big challenge. But our focus from the beginning was to make this kind of work more accessible for those who are not computer scientists, and um, and so the modeling library, the model library, got a lot of traction. Uh, we have uh, we share a little bit of education material. Um, we also have in the in January we have a, um, a winter school for for people who are more advanced, but to work on these kind of topics. We start working on uh, Dockerization of of um, uh, the work because a lot of older work cannot be in a way. Uh, uh, and a lot of people may not know all these things. I, I'm, I'm kind of pretty ignorant about those things, but I have still some very old laptops that I can run yeah. some of my old work, but that should not be the case. And a lot of work is in a way, uh, um, yeah, a lot of classic models. I know, I know from, I replicated some classic models and I contacted the authors and they did not know which, uh, what they had used, they cannot run their own work mm -hmm. anymore. So this is uh, probably a, an issue broader in the computational sciences, but um, so the model libraries is one of the key elements here. Uh, we have a conference, a virtual conference in October. Uh, we will, this year we invite a number of working on this uh, Open Modeling Foundation to, to talk. Um, so this will be recorded videos that people can uh, interact with the speakers. So you will find information on this website. Um, yeah. Is the is the the cyber infrastructure maintained through the big data hub and the yes. spokes? Okay. Program. Yeah. So yeah. So we have uh, we could hire uh, two staff members uh, that work work on this. So. We had one person who was uh, funded by the university who has been working on this, but to really make it the next step, we could hire some extra. It will be a challenge to be able to continue this. Uh, 
but we, yeah. So this is a, a bigger issue in general where we will fund cyber infrastructure. Um, NSF seems to be reluctant to take up the, they require to, you to archive all your work, but nobody seems to be willing to fund the archives. Um, mm -hmm. So this seems to become a, a challenge. Uh, when, what, what's the, because people will not pay for it. Mm -hmm. this, it's not in our community that we are happy people will archive their work. <laughs> So if they have to pay for it, then forget that they will, will do that. Right. So. Yeah, especially with the bigger data sets we're finding, that's one of the things we're looking at in the cyber infrastructure project I'm working on, um, where we're trying to take digital objects and submit them to the Texas digital libraries. Um, but most of the data that's shared currently is, is rather small. So finding ways to actually submit the very, very large data sets is going to be one of those challenges because it does come down to who's going to pay to keep it. <laughs> yes. And the libraries don't have the space to store the large digital objects. Yeah. But it now becomes, this kind of uh, work becomes much more accessible uh, because we have uh, now a, a number of widely used tools. I have been also going to high schools and middle schools to um, show uh, students the NetLogo. It's a very easy to use platform. Um, so in that way, it's become much more accessible. Um, but if you want to do it for, for uh, as a research tool, you you still have to learn a lot of the basic uh, science behind it. But um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like statistics in a way. Uh, you can do statistics uh, without knowing a lot of the underlying mathematics, uh, which can be a, a danger. Um, but uh, uh, those tools become more accessible and, and people start using it in, a, in much more, many more, um, discipline so it becomes an acceptable uh, that was in initially a challenge within the social science not all social science are quantitative oriented I was 10 years a faculty member in anthropology oriented uh, school and not all faculty members were supportive of me doing uh, computational work hmm. uh, so yeah that's uh, uh, but that becomes increasingly accepted that you uh, using computer simulation of social phenomena. Thank you for being so generous with your time and, and thank you for sharing all of the information and especially I liked, I really appreciate that you, you gave it a scope that both connected with what many of the members of our group are looking at but also helped to connect us out so that it expanded people's um, kind of view to how our um, earth and biophysical focused research can connect more closely with social sciences research. So I really appreciate that. Um, Ime or Pat, do you guys have anything else that you wanted to ask or say? Oh, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, nothing else. Yeah. Um, Marco, if you don't mind sharing the slides, it'd be terrific if, um, if you could email them to Ime or myself. I'm not sure if you've got our email addresses, but... Um, I think so. I, yes. I will send it to you. Okay. And I will actually sit here right now and try to edit so I can post the, um, just the lecture part of our call today on our YouTube channel. And I really appreciate everything again. And, and thank you. And hopefully we'll see, oh, well, we'll see you at GSA. Yes. I'll see you at GSA. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye, okay. everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.